Latinx Super Friends Playwriting Hour. I'm your host, <laughs> Lalo Rivas, and Thea Rogers is here. Um, really we'll make you full that. screen for that next time. First thing I want to say is Black Lives Matter. Second thing I want to say is I'm really excited to have um, uh, Brian Quijada here. Um, we, I, I taught at the University of Iowa and Brian had left, so we didn't get to meet until later on when he started to blow up in Chicago and New York. And now he's a bona fide um, multifaceted artist. And, and I invited him to share all his secret Jedi tricks. And I, I'm really happy to have you here. Brian, I'm going to hand it over to you. And yeah. Oh, my God. What an intro. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. It's, what's up, then, everybody? Yeah. Do you want uh, us to keep you on time? Like, do you want us to tell you when it's like 45? I, like, I got, you know what? I got, this, I got to look on the time. But if, but, but, but yes, also for sure. I, I sometimes go on tangents. So keep me in right. check. Cool. Um, Is everybody ready to go? Lovely. Okay, cool. Um, All right. Here we go. Um, Brian, so, yeah. Before. Um, so my name is Brian Quijada, Quijada, uh, spelled with a Q, not a K, not spelled with an H, but a J, Q-U-I-J-A-D-A. -A. Um, some teachers in school would try to pronounce my name, try to astound our class with their profound multicultural knowledge, only show our class that <clears throat> they probably didn't take Spanish in college. Uh, let's try and give this a shot. Is it Quijada? Quajada? Al-Qaeda? No, it's not but the attempt is much appreciated and I'm a little less aggravated when some people mess it up. because so when they fall on their face, it's up to me to pick them up. Now rest assured they've endured a life of Latinless names, but now everybody's mature. Time to know where the Quijada name came. You see Quijada in Spanish means jaw, it means jaw. Brian Jaw would be a hell of an easier name to pronounce, but I can't just go and announce that my name is Brian Jaw. I mean, that'd be against law. I mean, unless I legally change my name to a name that's yes, a little more comprehensive. The legal process would be expensive. My parents would probably think it was offensive. Am I going to change my name to Brian Jaw? Hell no. Nah. I can't separate the name. I can't split like a tendon that's been ruptured. I'm happy to be from a family with a long line of strong facial bone structure. It's where we got our name. You know who's to blame? Well, I shouldn't say blame. You know who was the cause? The ancient jerk who went around pointing out people's flaws. This ancient jerk went around town making fun of people and went to my great, 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 great grandfather said, look at that guy, his jaw is huge, which probably made my great, 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 great grandfather Scrooge. Probably stayed at home, never left his place, never saw the sun because he was ashamed to show his face, would just sit at home and cry. My Quijada is so huge. He wasn't Italian. Well, I say that those tears shall not go unredeemed because having his descendants proud of his name is probably what my great, 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 great grandfather would have dreamed. Now, I know that some of you on this Zoom uh, might have it worse, stuck with the um, non-phonetic name curse, only properly pronounced in the old country. So here I sit virtually in front of you, humbly, asking you not to be ashamed of your name. My name is Brian Quijada. Quijada spelled with a Q, not a K, not spelled with an H, but a J. <clears throat> Thus concludes my name poem. Um, I, wanted, I, 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 I wanted to kind of start off by doing this uh, to not only, I, it's a nice way to introduce myself, but it's, a, it's also like kind of a, a, a poem that I er, wrote very early on. Um, I wrote it at Iowa, speaking of Iowa, um, and um, it's kind of a, a, a piece that's kind of stuck with me and, and its form for a long time. Um, to give you a, a kind of a brief, uh, super brief uh, description of how I have, how I've, how I'm sitting here, right, talking is um, I, I say that I'm an actor, a musician, a playwright, and a composer. And I, and I say it in that order because that's the order in which I've come to find these things. Um, I started as an actor. Uh, it's all I did at Iowa. And then uh, like through the new play festivals and then found myself uh, pretty frequently at the National Playwrights Conference, the O'Neill Acting. Um, and, uh, and then I started writing. And then uh, now uh, I spend a lot, most of my time composing music for musicals. Um, and uh, I would, now that I'm making a lot of music, I've come to realize how much of an impact music has made 
uh, on my life, like how much music has affected me, like from the very beginning, M music played in our house all the time. My dad listened to a bunch of boleros and mariachis and um, like salsas and merengues. And it's awesome. My mom loved American rock. And um, we were huge hip hop heads, me and my brothers. Um, so like music was always playing the house. And <laughs> I was lucky that my parents, I was the last, I was the baby. So uh, by the time they got to me, they didn't care what we were listening to. Um, it could be curse word written like it, it didn't matter we could listen to I watched Die Hard at like three years old I don't even know if that's true but it felt like I watched it very early on I just wasn't censored and I'm actually very fortunate uh, that I wasn't censored because um, it just opened up my, the, the from very early long on listening to this like wide vocabulary of music um, but I, but as I've kind of worked on music um, I realized that music has played a huge part in all of my art forms. Like even like quite simply, um, um, like I think about pitch and speed and dynamics and rhythm in speech. Like I think about it now a lot in music, obviously, but now like, I'm just like, oh, if my voice is super slow and almost staccato, it builds suspense and the pitch is low. So it's calm and you're listening in and we're all really paying attention. And then as soon as I start picking up the speed and my pitch starts going up, you're just like, oh my God, he's getting so excited. Oh my God, so much emotion is just shown in, in the dynamics of how I'm speaking, in the rhythm that I'm talking in and in pitch. Um, it's crazy and it kind of has blown my mind now to like really start uh, like focusing on music and seeing how those things really were tools that I hadn't quite defined um, as a, as a performer, um, um, and it's really interesting how how these kind of things all correlate. Um, anyway, I came to start writing um, because, like a lot of I think, uh, BIPOC artists, we we write because we don't necessarily see um, a, uh, a, a, a an avenue where we can see ourselves. Um, you know, like uh, I had a breakthrough moment composing a part for a middle-aged Latin dude, or like, you know, kind of young adult, I would just say a young man uh, who uh, sings and raps in a baritone bass voice. Um, it's a big deal because uh, I love musicals, but I could never be in them because I could never sing high. Um, my voice is pretty low. So uh, it's a pre pretty empowering thing to be able to write now parts that I would have loved to have played um, early on. Um, but the, the, now that I'm working on music a lot um, and writing a bunch of music, I, 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 uh, there's, a, there's a poetic form that I kind of want to introduce to you guys, unless you guys already know it, but um, I, I, I was recently introduced to it and I'm just like, oh my God, so much is based on here. It's a poem, it's a villanelli, that's the, the form. Um, it's an Italian word. It was uh, uh, kind of um, uh, made popular by a French poet um, who that then kind of blew it up in England. Um, so villanelli is basically um, it's a very, very super specific um, uh, rhyming pattern, but in its simplicity, if I could just like simply put it, it's just a poem that recreates its chorus into a way that changes throughout um, the piece. Um, so I'd like to read you a, 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 a kind of very famous poem um, uh, that, um, it, that I kind of reread um, and um, recently, and I was like, I, I, I knew about the poem before, but now given the times and what's happening in America, um, it kind of rings even louder uh, today. So I'm gonna read it for you guys. Can we pull it up? All right, you got that? Yes, yes. So uh, do not go gentle into that good night is the name of the poem by Dylan Thomas. Um, <clears throat> do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end know dark is right because their words had forked no lightning. They do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learn too late they grieved it on its way. 
do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay, rage. Rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. Again, Dylan poem, uh, Dylan Thomas's poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. So if you look at the structure of this um, kind of poem, it's a very super specific way of introducing a chorus at the very beginning and then throughout the piece, repeating pieces of it um, that then by the end, you experience the text in a completely different way. Um, uh, I, love, I love the form. I think it's awesome. Um, I also think that uh, this kind of form has in a way has been just adapted in what we consider to be like a pop song, a kind of um, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus type of song, maybe a bridge in there, right? Um, but it's a really effective one. And, I, and it's one that I realized that I kind of have adapted and uh, used as a rule of law. I mean, obviously with some liberties taken, even in thinking uh, of applying this to like a whole play. Um, I have a solo show called Where Did We Sit on the Bus? Um, it's, um, it's named after a, a piece in the play about me in the, being in the third grade and raising my hand and, and asking my third grade teacher during a lesson on civil rights and Martin Luther the King, uh, um, where a Latino sat on the bus. And she couldn't answer the question and it kind of exploded my whole world. And um, it led to me kind of exploring all these questions. The beginning of the play though, starts with me proposing to my now wife and saying, how are we gonna raise this kid? I'm, she, she, she's she's uh, half Austrian, half Swiss, and um, my parents are from El Salvador. So I'm like, oh, like what, what do I have? What's my half of what our child will eventually uh, become? And what, how will they identify? Um, and then it goes into exploration of how I learned to identify myself and how I fit uh, in a kind of uh, very complicated racial landscape in America and how brown fits in a black and white spectrum in America. Um, so, but to me, looking at that piece as a whole play, that's the question, that's the thesis, that's the chorus is being like, what is the story that I will pass on to my child? And at the very end, it returns. So kind of like in a, if, we, if we like kind of like look at this, uh, what this poem does so effectively in telling you the chorus, telling you the thesis, and then going through it, repeating this thesis, repeating this kind of thing that is at the crux of why we're doing this poem in the first place or why we're telling these stories or why we're doing this play um, is something that stick with, so it, it sticks with me. Um, uh, I'm going to do another, I'm going to do another, I was telling uh, Paolo yesterday, I was just like, you know what, uh, another good piece, like this one isn't as well known, it isn't as famous, but there's another uh, piece that I really love. Um, my parents also really love this song. Uh, I'm going to do it for you. I'm not going to sing it, I'm going to rap it because, you know, that's, you know, that's the medium that I'm going to do it in. Um, it's called Cats in the Cradle. It's by uh, Harry uh, Ch uh, Chapin. Um, um, the actual song goes, my child just arrived just the other day. He came to the world in a usual way, but they were planes to catch and bills to pay. Yeah, he learned to walk while I was away and he was talking for a new wit. And as he grew, he'd say, I'm gonna be like you, dad. You know, I'm gonna be like you. Cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, dad, I don't know when, but we'll be together then. You know, we'll have a good time then. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed. I said, I'm gonna be, it said, I'm gonna be like him. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna be like him. Yeah, and the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know, we'll have a good time then. Well, he came home from college just the other day. So much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile, 
What I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you're coming home, son, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, Dad. You know we'll have a good time then. I've long since retired and my son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids have the flu and it's, but it's sure been nice talking to you, Dad. It's sure been nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you coming home, son, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, Dad. We're gonna have a good time then. Um, Jesus, that part, uh, Jesus, even like reading it now, it's like, I have daddy issues. So like, I have a very, <laughs> like, I have a very like, uh, uh, weird connection to that, to that piece, uh, to that song. Um, but um, it's kind of a, a very powerful. And, and it's one of those songs that I think in like the, you know, the hit, like, the umbrella of American uh, songs. Uh, uh, and um, I, I find it to be incredibly moving and a great kind of example of an adaptation of this Villanelli poem where that, that the poem repeats, uh, and I'm sorry, that the chorus repeats, but it repeats in a, in a way that, that alters the way that we experience the storytelling of that poem, of that song. And I think it's incredibly powerful. Um, uh, and that's kind of how I've come to uh, understand really my own kind of approach to um, writing not only songs, but writing plays um, is viewing them as viewing the, the, what I want to say in the piece as the chorus. What is the, what is the thesis that I'm, how, that I'm approaching um, in saying, in, in, in whatever I'm saying? And how can I repeat that throughout the play so that we don't forget, even if we stray, we don't forget what we're talking about, whether it's like the story of a, of a son and his father um, and how that relationship changes or whether like I can spell, I can spell you my name to begin with, just to introduce myself. And then at the very end of that poem, it's empowerment um, and spelling the name, each letter carries a different weight. Um, does that all make sense? Could I just get a like thumbs up? Everybody's with me. Um, sick. So um, what I'd like to do is um, uh, I'd like to um, try here uh, 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 where we do an exercise um, where we kind of I give you kind of a, 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 like a super simple breakdown of like again like very down like it's not uh, Villanelli is a kind of like a very complex uh, form and um, I think we I've made a I've made a much simpler kind of um, uh, prompt um, or, or kind of form to follow. Um, can we pull that up, please? Yeah, absolutely. There we go. We got it. Yeah. So it's a so Great. it's a, a little writing exercise. I'd like to try. Um, does everybody have like pen and paper or a computer? Or I mean, you guys. I mean, we're on technology. Great. So this is what I'd like to do is. Um, so this is the this is the form that we're going to try and attempt here. The prompt um, is origin story. So that's what this piece is going to be about. Whatever this means to you, origin story, your origin story, somebody else's origin story. Origin story is the prompt. Um, you're going to start the, this exercise with two lines. Um, I've written A A in case you want to rhyme them. Um, you don't have to, this is not like, you're writing raps, you're writing songs. But if you don't rhyme, consider that AA is a couplet, two lines that relate to each other, even if they don't rhyme. Followed by this chorus that will be the thesis of, your, of this origin story prompt, we're gonna go into the first verse which is a couplet, BB, and then CC. Again, you can use that as a rhyming pattern. If not, just make sure that those two lines and the next two lines connect. You're gonna repeat the chorus right after that. The exact, you could either repeat it exactly the way it is, or you could pull a Harry Chapin. Ch Chapin, is that is how you pronounce his name? I don't know how we pronounce his name. 
cats in the cradle. You can pull a cats in the cradle and like kind of twist it a little bit uh, and give it like a, you know, like a little edge. Extra credit points if you can give it a little edge. Verse two is the, basically the same as verse one. It's just another two set of couplets followed by a repeat of the chorus. Um, again, change it if you need to alter it or totally repeat it, um, but make sure that if it is the same, that we experience the last chorus, the AA, in a, in a kind of a different way with a different tinge, the way that we experience when you first said it um, or when you first wrote it or the, the way that we experience the first two lines as it's read or spoken. Does that all make sense to everybody? Uh, thumbs up. Sweet. Um, let's do. Let's take like. Um, let's take um, fifteen minutes um, to try and uh, pump something out, um, and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll have like a couple minutes to share if anybody wants to share. But again, just uh, just focus on the writing for now. So fifteen minutes. I'm gonna play some music in case uh, this helps anybody.
Five more minutes.
One minute, start finishing up. And that's time. How was that? Thumbs up? It's awesome. Isn't it? Um uh yeah, um I've found that sometimes um it's uh, great to write to music, uh and sometimes it isn't. Um I've uh, I'd I'd be I'd be interested in anybody's um kind of um uh, experience in how writing was as chord progression changes. Um, 
and how even like dynamics in how I was playing some chords and how they started changing the dynamics, how that affected anybody. Um, uh, uh, does anybody have any thoughts? I, I don't know how to, I've never done this. The rate, does anybody have yeah. like, raise, is that possible raising of hands or? Yeah, I, I'm not going to share what I wrote because it's like not finished, but I will say that just having the challenge of the structure was really, was really great. And to try to fill that in with, with everything that was kind of coming through with the sound was really, was really awesome. Awesome. But um, awesome. if Thea will let, you will you tell folks if they if they want to share and yeah yeah absolutely we've been using the raise hand function it's down at the bottom if you hit participants there should be a blue hand if you don't see it there's a little dot 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 you hit that and then there should be a blue hand and if you don't see it at all go ahead and toss it in the chat and I will uh, I'll do my best to unmute people as as quickly as we can um, first one is Luyana oh I have an ask to unmute prompt here. Um, it work? Yeah, we got you. Okay, cool. Can just go for it? Sure? Yes, 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 please. Okay, sure. Um, Viviana, full of life, they tell It's different as hell, you see? Ecuador and PA, where do I fit? I see different colors all my life. Always the brown girl who couldn't sit. Tell me who I am because trust me, I don't know shit. Viviana, full of life, they tell me. The two worlds don't allow me to be. So God, if you're there, fix this, because even I don't think I belong on this list. Brown girl, go back where you're from, but what if where I'm from is too much to become? Viviana, full of life, they tell me. Where do I fit? Because trust me, I don't need, I don't know me, see? <laughs> mm. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. We have Brenda next. Hola. Hola. <laughs> um, I've led a lie and I don't really know where to begin. I have to admit it, I don't know my origin. I claim to know my heritage, where I come from, pretending and declaring my love where my father came from. But through my statements of pride, I've walked a fine line, not really knowing the meanings and the colors of our vines. I've let a lie and the problem is I don't know where to begin. I embarrassingly admit it, I'm scared to know my origin. I want to know my cultural history and connections, but it reminds me of my father who butchered our relations. Why is Chuco called Chuco? Is it Chuco? Why do I look white? The more I find, the more separated I feel in my birthright. I don't know my origin, but I want to love the beginning. I have to admit it. I know a lot more of my origin than when I stated it. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Quijada, Chuco, are you Salvadoran? I am. W what? Are we related? I know. Okay, so I know Jean Darling, and she uh, hired me to be a solo performance for California State University Summer Arts Program, and she told me she knew you and asked me if we're related, and I don't know. Wow! Wow! We need to do one of those like swab things. We need to find out our ancestry. Oh my God, that's amazing. Nice to meet you. Beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. This isn't over. We need to find you figure this out. <laughs> yeah. Next up we have Amanda. Hi. The working title for this is gonna be Big Bang. That's what I think. Awesome. Um, you want to get inside me, but I cannot accommodate. There is no vacancy here. If you wanted to fill me, well, I am a void. If you try too hard to change my nature, I will swallow you and spit out stardust. You want to get inside me, but I cannot accommodate. This implies comfort with the idea that I am a yawning, empty thing on my own, that you are a guest, not a meal, sustenance for my infinite expansion. You want to get inside me, but I cannot accommodate. Mm. Beautiful, thank you. Alexis. Hello, also Brian, I'm repping the O'Neill. Yes, me yes. too, I'm repping it on my hat. You can't tell because it's black on yes. black. <laughs> All right, so in um, O'Neill fashion, I popped off a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. No speak Spanish, tu no mexicana, 
You should need have to learn your language, muchacha. Whose fault is it you don't speak Spanish? Tu abuela? She taught me more than a language. If you want to blame someone, blame Dora. I started running out of excuses and got creative and said, my parents messed up and taught me French or German or even Arabic. I grew up with kids who thought they were stupid. The I'm afraid to speak kind of stupid. The wheels turning in their head as they try to translate to their parents with the DMV worker, cashier, etc. just said, speaking Spanish at home, broken English at school. At that age, language shouldn't be an obstacle, it's a tool to express their ideas, paint pictures with imagination, not to be the transition period of their parents' assimilation. No speak Spanish? Tu no mexicana. You may be brown on the outside, but you're a coconut, mija. So you say because I don't speak Spanish, I'm not Mexican, but that's just a start. We've got to dive deeper if you're trying to take away my brown card. I hate tequila. I've never been to Mexico. Actually, back up, tequila hates me, screaming, I've got to get out of this white girl as it jumps out of me. Yeah, I don't speak Spanish. I roll my R's, I dance bachata, but I don't speak Spanish. I love red lipstick, gold jewelry, watched telenovelas growing up, but didn't understand a word because I don't speak Spanish. I grew up in fear of La Llorona, getting pregnant before 16. I don't have to speak Spanish to know what La Chancla means. <laughs> don't tell me who I am because of what I do or don't speak. Look, if you want to nitpick my vocabulary, it's very colorful, believe me. No speak is Spanish. I'm still a Latina. And you're not my grandma, so don't call me mija. Pop off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Hell yeah. Solana. Aha, uh -huh, can't I can't follow that. But I was playing with the idea of like being mixed, because that's something I feel like comes. Oh, yes, for sure. Exist. Riding along, you sit in the middle. They take so much and they give you so little. Looking around, you watch them all go to each of their sides, wondering, wondering how they know. You can't pick a side, you can't play that part. You love both sides with all of your heart. Walking along, you sit in the middle. They take so much and give you so little. You give them what they need to see and finally they just let you be. But you go beyond what was ever expected, never fearing that you'd be rejected. Running along, you slide from the middle, being much more, no longer so little. Finally winning something they'd never know, finding yourself needing more room to grow. You make a plan and you plot the course. You say your goodbyes, leaving without any remorse. Gliding along, you break from the middle. You're taking up space, never letting yourself be given so little. Mm. Beautiful, thank you. Hell yeah. Marilo? Uh, mine's very, very different than everybody else's. Uh, Great. The lake stampedes, they came before the earth and the sun arrived. And in the night, the voice sang in her song of despair, she wanted others to arrive. The lake stampedes, they came before the earth and the sun arrived. There were no others to hear her. No one will listen, not the fastest horse will ease her loneliness. The lake stampedes, they came before the earth and the sun arrived. On the road of our defeat, we shall wander, wander. On the road of our defeat, we shall wander. Love it, thank you. Beautiful. Yes. Shelly? Hey. Hello, Shelly. Good to see you, Ryan. You too. Uh, my friend's uh, baby is crying <laughs> in the background, so I apologize That's for that. That's great. Um, yeah, welcome, George. <laughs> um, first, got to say, thank you for holding this space, y'all. Um, I've been to a lot of Zooms in the past couple of weeks that have been meditations for Black Lives and um, they're super beautiful, but I always leave feeling really heavy and your music was like really healing for me. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. They met at a jazz fest on the Hartford Green. His camera caught a picture of her by the carousel. Destiny, if you know what I mean just years after interracial marriage became legalized. She ran from Crosby, Connecticut, saw stars in his eyes. New Orleans became their home and magical escape, but black magic and voodoo blood couldn't predict their fate. They met at a jazz fest in a summer heat. Black and white babies would make them complete. Grandma black on the one side of the railroad tracks. Grandma white couldn't face the facts that love prevails, Whew. and dreams can come true. 
Cancer, liquor, greed really played them fools. They met at a jazz fest on the Hartford Green, but his camera didn't catch her death in the lens of their dreams. Beautiful, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Amazing. Um, wow, thanks. That's what we got for raised hands. Anybody uh, having trouble with the raised hand function wanna share? Go ahead and unmute yourself, yeah. Great. Is Felipe, that, is, did you? Sure. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thanks. Uh, I, yeah, I was having trouble with the raised hands. Uh, cool. Grew up white with a Latino father. Called me mijo, said te amo, pero caught in Iowa slaughtered. Reunions con la familia taught me who I am. But long drives home, turn the pachangas to a distant hymn. Fleabag, Phil, Flip, Felipe. Fuck it, I can't say your name, man, so just fucking play. Grew up white with a Latino father. Call me mijo, se te amo, pero cotton, I was slaughtered. When the kid wanting friends, white face is laughing. Me undercover, but letting stab slice, just keep passing. Not a kid, wanting friends, white faces laughing, fuck a friend, feelings hid, time to with an Ecuadorian father. Papa, now you see me, but I got to see me. Hasta luego, white slaughter. Ooh. Thank you, thank you, beautiful. Thanks. Wow. Was that the last hand? Think so. Looks like it, yeah. All right. It's amazing. Thank you all for sharing. Um, it's, uh, it's 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 awesome. Like you know what uh, an exercise like that can like you know I mean like origins. I mean it's you learn so much from people and thank you for you know for the the shared and it's 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 a brave it, thing. It's a brave thing. It it also reveals the power of repetition, right? Yeah, totally. Uh, not not just in words, in movement, and sound, but it just you know. Totally. I mean, you know, you see us and emotions and absolutely, um, uh, and how you can really flip it as a writer. You can actually like take that audience on that journey, and you have like, I feel like you know the first those first two stanzas you write or the chorus. It's like really grounds you in what what kind of world you want to evoke and yeah. then it kind of sets the template for the rest of it to kind of go in different you know tributaries which is exactly but somehow come back to it like somehow find your way back it's like it's like the story of a journey right going in a circle it's finding your way back and um it's like all you know the odyssey you know it's like on your way to come back home um, odyssey. oh the greeks came into this conversation <laughs> <laughs> all right um th this is the this is now we can, can we go into q a can we ask let's you no let's go all right first question is brenda your cousin no i'm kidding no no <laughs> anybody wants to anybody wants to ask any questions of brian go ahead. uh use yeah, we got one from viviana it looks like hey uh thank you so much for being here today it really means a lot thanks for um, having me. yeah of course um so right out of college you went to iowa um, where was like your process? I, I just graduated college last year and obviously with the pandemic and everything else going on in our uh, global climate right now, it's, uh, it's a little frustrating to see where our careers are going to go and like where to take the next steps are. So I was just wondering how your process was after, after school. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I, uh, so I went to Iowa and uh, Iowa pumps out a lot of playwrights. Um, really great playwrights that come out of Iowa. Um, so I, I, I happened to go to school with uh, Idris Goodwin, Jen Silverman, Tony Meneses, um, Kevin Arteague, um, Sam Hunter had just graduated. So I kind of had a network of the people that I went to school with and with Iowa. Um, the, the first, speaking of the O'Neill, the first few times that I, my first three summers at the O'Neill were working on plays that I had worked on in, in college with college friends. Um, I consider to be, I consider college and my friends from school um, 
like lifelong collaborators. I mean, like it's it's a moment where like those friends are the ones that like we leveled out. Like, you know, like you, we all learned together. No, there was no, there's not a lot of egos. And it's just like, we're all here. To, we're all in an, in an educational institution together. So like we all came out of their equals. Um, and uh, it was, it, I stuck to the people that like I love making work with. Um, and it just so happened that some of them blew up and um, I was just, I was just kind of an actor in their, in their, in their plays. And so I just kind of went along for the ride. Um, but like, I, 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 I'm kind of a huge, I'm like proponent of like, you, you know who your community is, right? Like you just graduated. And yes, I mean, this, like given the state of the world, it, it, there's a lot of uncertainty, but you know that the people that you trust and you love to look over your work or to like make things with are still those people. And those are the people like you're all like there's a generation as as ever like anybody who graduates from school it's like the next generation it's like the next movement of people to bring new work into um the world and uh i think that's really exciting you know like regardless of what the world you know it's it's yeah. the world is pretty crazy but like there's something in beautiful and like sticking with your your the people that you know and your friends and eventually you like it, it, it just trickles out like this person knows this person and you're like oh my god this wor this world is really the, the especially at the theater world is so small right. um it's tiny uh and and you just get that way if you if you know if you keep making the things that you love um with the people that you love um i think you'll find your way and that's how what i did i just kind of found my way through through being with my friends and my okay, awesome. collaborators yeah that's awesome thank you so much yeah Hey. Hello again. Hey. Um, so I guess that kind of goes in line with my question. Um, I have a solo show that I've been working on for a long time now, and um, I've gotten to share it in some way or another, like through readings and things, but um, like the doors have yet to be opened for me um, to share it like on a larger scale. And I guess now's the time, right? Like we don't know what, where theater's gonna go and maybe it'll end up being like a virtual share. But um, how did you, how did you start? Like where did, with, where did we sit on the bus? Um, yeah. Where was it first produced? Who did it? Do you have their number? <laughs> or like, can we get this going? <laughs> That's amazing, yes, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I first, uh, um, I first did it with Teatro Vista and then from that point Teatro Vista was were like the first people that believed in the show and um, we did it and they were like they took a chance on somebody who had never been produced before um, like a brand new play it was my first play um, and they took a chance um, and we got amazing reviews and uh, like we sold out the run and it was re really I'm really proud of the fact that like the show like it was a success and it led to it moving off Broadway and then um, or, I've been doing it for five years um, uh, all around the country um, but it was them them that first believed in me um, uh, I submitted my I submitted my solo show. I think I would say what I would say is and, and you probably have already but like submitted everywhere to to every like organization that like not only develops work seven devils playwrights conference the o'neill the, the national playwrights conference um i mean the, the the thing that i first submitted it to was solo nova um which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore in new york um but um i, I submitted it everywhere to everyone i let everybody read it and um but um that that that's like what i will say when i first started writing it that is something that I kind of still stick with and I think it's um, important to me to stick with this ideology as somebody, uh, um, well, Idris Goodwin, who's a, a good friend and, and mentor of mine, um, uh, um, I was in his, I was an actor in, um, in uh, his, his was the very first play, it was called How We Got On, it was the first play that I went to the O'Neill with, um, with his play, we went to school together. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of came up with him. I mean, as an actor, I saw him like kind of rise to, you know, the playwright that he is now. Um, and um, he said something really interesting to me is he's just, um, he's just like, I think starting out, you have to write something that you envision uh, being able to be done out of a garage or in a basement. Um, you have to make things that uh, doesn't require, like you could do on a budget, like on a, a shoestring budget, like it, it, and I've kind of, the bus requires my equipment 
and like a table for me to put it on my solo show. Mm -hmm. um, it, it requires just a, a speaker basically and my instruments. Um, and it's kind of born out of this idea. A lot of my plays are kind of born out of this idea that like, if you can make something um, that you feel you can do anywhere, like that you can just set up shop and do it on the street, like do it, like open up your garage, like do it a virtual performance, like power to accessibility. Like, right. I, I think that's amazing. I think it's a, a beautiful thing. I think personally, I think some of the best theater in America is being done in the cafeteria of a, of a college campus. You know what I mean? Like the, like, or like the basement of, of high school. Like, I really do think that like, amazing amazing work the, maybe the for great forgotten work uh, it doesn't matter but like some of the most powerful work is being done um and affecting like the people that it affects if it's not like you know i mean yes there's something of like yes i want the whole, whole world to see it um but like there's something to me that like drives me and and like lights a flame in me that is just like i have plays that nobody's ever seen before and like and that's okay like i know that the people that have seen it uh is like it's affected, you know what I mean? Like it's, I kind of have um, that, that um, uh, principle of being able to do it just for your community is really powerful and, and important. So yes, there is, that's the, that's the big and the, like, that's like the, the philosophy along with like the actual, uh, you know, how to steps I would say, but I want to see your solo show. <laughs> Duh, let's do it. <laughs> Um, I, just to add on to that, I, I think there are just a number of, of festivals that are going online anyway, so submit to them because... Yeah. Also, solo work is going to be the thing that old theater, that it's the only thing that theaters can do. Yeah, I know. Of, it's like, right. yeah, well, you can write a play with everyone being six feet apart, but you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So... Um, Shelly Fort, I have a question for you. Do you are you related at all, or do you know Lydia Fort, the director? I know of her. I would. Uh, get you need to do a touch. cotton swab. <laughs> I would get in touch with them because uh, they teach. Uh, she and I went to went to the same grad school. She's now at Theater uh, Emory University. Okay. Um, I would just say, hey. We have the same last name, but <laughs> the, the, uh, Shelly, uh, I'm sorry, Lydia is based in, in Atlanta. So I don't, I don't know where you are, but just tell her I said, <laughs> I sent you and it'll be fine. Cool, thank you. <laughs> right, who's next? Yeah, we have Ana Sofia. You are unmuted. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for being here to talk with us. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I watched a performance of Where Do We Sit on the Bus at KCACTF. Yes. About four years ago. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and um, I was attending a predominantly white college and competing in the directing sector of that mm. festival with the Jose de Vera play. Um, Amazing. So that was exciting with being on this uh, a couple weeks ago uh, with him. Yeah. Um, and that was incredibly meaningful because I was feeling very... Um, isolated and um, there was a lot of discussions about style and, and um, uh, magical realism that was very hard to hear in that, in that, uh, at that time. Um, it was very isolating. Anyways, your play meant so much to me. I think um, I was actively trying not to have like snot and tears running down my face. I was not successful. Oh, um, that's very sweet, thanks. <laughs> but thank you for that. Um, but I remember thinking, um, you didn't answer the historical question of where did we sit on the bus? And maybe you did, and I just didn't recall it, or maybe that was an earlier version. Um, but I would really love to hear you speak to that, uh, especially given the Black Lives Matter movement and what that means for Latinxes, I mean, particularly Afro Latinxes, but uh, for all Latinxes and, and Latinx theater makers, um, where do we for sit sure. on the bus in, in this kind of landscape of American theater? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I do, I do answer it. It's a, like a, it's. A, I basically Sorry. say, no, no, no. It's okay it, because it's, it's. Uh, um, I think it, um, the the big going for the the big back and forth of of answering that question to full depth was being like, cool. Am I am I going to? I mean, yes. I named the show. Where do we sit on the bus? Um, but it, I think it's like, you know the history the histories in, in in the books and 
Um, but I say in the play that we would have, um, I'm just like, your, your mom would have sat in the front and your dad would have sat in the back. Mm -hmm. um, because historically, um, it, it's white and color and colored, right? Like, so um, we would have sat in the back. The thing that I'm unpacking in this time um, is um, kind of still how I, uh, like colorism is a real thing. And I understand, like I am beginning to unpack kind of like as this continues and Black Lives Matter for sure. It's like, I am, I, I am recognizing that some people think I'm a white guy, you know? Um, and, and what that means and the privilege that that has gotten me. I mean, I've also been like doing my own, like, you know, like how systemic racism has affected me, but also on the other end of being like, what can I do to help here? Um, and I think it's a very complicated question because as I was doing my research, I was asking myself, okay, Brian Quijada, born right before the civil rights movement, gets on the bus. Where do I, where would I actually, like, like where would the, like, could I potentially sit in the front? Could I? Like, this is some like deep, like, like kind of, you know, questions that I'm asking myself now of like being like, man, would I have like, what would I have passed? Because that's really what it is, is that like, uh, you know, there was a lot of, uh, um, if you, if uh, 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 like a really rich Mexican, a really rich Spaniard or European descent comes to the United States, they were treated like a white person, you know, they were treated with respect and not like a, a, a black person. So it's, it's, yes, like colored people, all like, like BIPOC people would have been sat in the back, but there is something deeper to unpack now, I think, as we're experiencing this uh, movement um, is this this additional question to it which is a really healthy and good thing i think to to think about um and when what that means i mean i think uh, since that play came out five years ago um i have i have not changed a single word mm. um and every time i do it over the years like that play was written and premiered during an obama administration and i do a play about immigration and I've done it in red states and I've done it like at key points of, of 45's um, kind of presidential career and it totally changes. And I think as I do it, people's perception of it also changes as long as my own kind of understanding of re-answering that question for myself. It's a great question and it's like we could, I could probably talk about it for 45 minutes. I mean, an additional 45 minutes. We can have another hour on this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but that's a great question. And I'm so happy that you saw it kind of in its early, early days. Yeah, me too. Um, Thank you. Yeah. It's great to meet you. You too. Next one's from Amanda. Hi. Hi. Um, I come from a music background. Mm -hmm. And I'm, a, I'm an undergrad. I'm a noob to theater and like playwriting and all this stuff, honestly. And so I was so it's so interesting to hear you talk about composition and writing and Linda, you picked up your guitar in our playwriting class and started, brought that into the, the space. And first of all, thank you for that. That was incredible. And um, second of all, I see a lot of like full length plays with songs now by like, specifically, I'm thinking like women of color um, playwrights, like mm -hmm. Susan Lowry and um, Caridad Switch and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so like thinking about how music is involved in our stories somehow or like bringing it into like this weird like cross genre thing that's not wholly a play and not really a musical either and like if you have thoughts about that this is like not a really great like well thought out question i just kind of want to hear you talk about this <laughs> yeah i mean <clears throat> i do a lot of um i do a lot of uh um um live looping in my shows which is kind of um uh, using technology to repeat a piece of music over and over again and building on top to create a, a composition. Um, there is um, uh, 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 turntablism that I use in plays, um, just like straight up scratching and like uh, finger drumming, which is uh, like an, usually an MP on an MPC, which is eight, an eight by eight squares. Each square rep like is a sound. So it's like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, kind of trying to involve really uh, some of my favorite forms of making, you know, specifically hip hop, uh, I'll be honest, um, but also like, you know, um, the, and the reason I think uh, I'm kind of drawn to it is because um, 
music, seeing live music to me is so powerful. It is so emotive. Like it's, 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 it, 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 I, I can leave a concert and feel on cloud nine. I could leave a concert and be like, oh my God, that music spoke to my soul. There could be no lyrics in it. Um, but I'm like so moved by live, by live music. Um, and like by the, it's artistry. I, I'm not a huge fan of like, <laughs> like as uh, uh, screamo music, um, uh, or like super like like blah, 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 like like really crazy rock and like like kind of the the I'm not super into it but if I would go watch that all day any day um, I'm incredibly impressed that they're not blowing out their voices there is a beautiful technique to screaming music like that um, uh, and I don't they the guitarists that are so much like eons but like so, they're so much better than I am on guitar so like there is something to the artistry of music that is captivating to me. And I love seeing it. Um, and it's a different, it's a different thing. Like you could listen to a Beyonce album and then you go see her live and you're like, what? You, this is a completely different experience. Um, and I think that's what it is. That's like the, the draw of it. And I think that's why I love doing it. And I'm sure why artists, other artists, you know, also love doing it is because watching the music along with what that music can do just orally is a different experience. And it's so, um, powerful. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but but that's why I like it. Um, question. So yeah, I was yeah. no, 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 no. I think it's great. Yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah. It was great. Like that was. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Another one from Brenda. Hey. 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 Hola, primo. What's up, guys? So, <laughs> um. So I have a question for you in regards to how you feel in trusting directors to do your so like help you work and direct your solo performance have you like what do you look for have you had a director look at your stuff and what is that relationship look like when you have your own personal stories and history coming into it and then a director who might come in and you know sure, yeah there's a fine uh, line. yeah it's a it's a tough it's a tough like uh um, I think for a playwright, uh, selecting a director is very difficult. And I've, I've, um, uh, I've had like, it's, it's a lot like you're investing in a relationship. Uh, I think it's, it's a lot like dating. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's very like, cool. Do we have the same values? And like, like, how are we going to like walk together? You know, like, how are we going to do this together? And I don't know that I agree with you on that, but like, I'll bear with it because I love so many other things that you do. You know, it's very like, it's, it's, it's soup. It's a very, it's a very, very tight relationship. Um, and it's tough for me. I, I, I tend, uh, like I have, I kind of, um, it, uh, I, I've kind of, I've worked with a bunch of different directors and not just solo pieces, but like another piece as well. And it's, it's like, what are the values, what are the values that I really think are important for this part of the process and if the, and and like if like that is no longer the case for the next part of the process then like we have to break up you know what I mean like it's like it did it, did, it didn't work out um not for like any reason you know it's not about you it's about me <laughs> you know it's like uh it's 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 in some cases like I'm just like cool especially like early on um it's I very much align with directors who can nurture me dramaturgically and guide me in a way that I, I know the the story will be guided as opposed to like, cool, now I'm like, this director's like just talking about design elements and I haven't even finished it. You know what I mean? Or like, it doesn't feel complete to me. Yeah. That is not an alignment of values of where I think the play is, is in its current process. You know what I mean? It, and, and, and that's the thing is that like, if, if I can talk to it, if, if I'm working on something that's like ready to be done. And then we start talking about design and what the, I'm just like, yeah, let's go. You know what I mean? Um, or like, or if I'm like ready to go and the and director's just like, y y yeah, like we, we need to rewrite everything. I'm like, oh snap, it's not gonna work out. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's so much like, it's it's actually like a, a getting to know the, the person and how you align it with whatever you need. Um, I did a, 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 a festival it was called the Baltic Playwrights Festival that was in association with the O'Neill. Um, and uh, it was like uh, like uh, five different teams and from different countries and we were the American team. And uh, I went to go see the Russian 
uh, I was sat in on some Russian uh, rehearsals and got to see their performance. And it's all about the director over there. Um, the director was like making cuts in the play. And I'm like, oh my God, what? you, good luck doing that in America. Like you wouldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't do that. That's like, that's like the cardinal rule. Like we, we say that the playwright is the, uh, is the American backbone. Um, and, and, but it's a totally different thing. So like that relationship is a, is a different one. And that play was beautiful. I will also say that that Russian play, I'm just like, oh my God, I couldn't believe that he did that. But it was also like turned out to be like a really great thing. It's just like a different dynamic that, 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 that it is here. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that in talking about the playwright relationship with the director is that it's not necessarily the same everywhere, everywhere else. Um, but here, I, my, under, my experience with it has been that um, I want to feel nurtured as the, as a writer, um, as the creator, as, yeah, as the being, bringing, be, uh, uh, birthing the piece. So I uh, hope that's good advice. Yeah, no, and I, I get to, to that, to that segue, I think my next question would be, um, how do you know when it's done? <laughs> when you feel, oh, you know what, this is, because I feel like I always, I always get told this is great. And then I always personally am like, no, this is not enough or this yeah. is not ready. Um, I can't really ever really differentiate when it's ready. It's a great question. I, I, um, uh, another great piece of advice that was, um, that was given to me uh, by my good friend, Idris Goodwin was, um, uh, somebody was just like, okay, cool. Are you going to start changing? Where did we sit on the bus? And, um, and it was kind of, you know, I'm like, do I kind of adapt it a little bit to make it a little more relevant or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I was talking to him about it. And he's just like, when a musical artist drops an album, that musical artist does not go back, take off a track off of Spotify, adjust it, and then put it back in there. When there, you've reached like a level of like, you're just like, I think it's complete. And like the team that I'm working with right now thinks it's complete and it's time to be released, you release it. Um, and if you have more kind of thoughts, you drop your next album. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's something, there's something beautiful about being like, cool, all right. What didn't I say? Or like, what, what fixes couldn't I have done? Or like, yes, there's something, I mean, people listen, this is my philosophy too, of being like, uh, of being like, uh, to me, I have to feel like something is complete. That's not the case for other people. People rewrite their People, I mean, I also respect that too. Uh, Luis, Luis Alfaro, um, we were working on Oedipus El Rey at the public. He's, he's done that play a million times. That play has been done so many times. We did it in New York and he wrote, rewrote it. And I think that's awesome. I'm just like, holy moly, that's amazing. That, that dude that, never finishes rewriting his play. That guy just continues. And I respect that as well. Um, so like there's different philosophies for sure about rewrites. To me, I've stuck to like being like, eh. This is this chapter. I, I can reflect on, I can look at where do we sit on the bus, same text, and be like, cool, this is the play that I wrote and completed in 2016. Mm -hmm. This is what my headspace was at then. Mm -hmm. And it's totally different now, but I've been writing new things that reflect um, an, a, an, ev an evolving artist, you know, an evolving um, chorus uh, thesis, you know? So, uh, that's my two cents, um, but people, I'm sure people have their, their, I mean, Luis, if you talk to Luis, he, he has a different response. Um, Thank you. Cool, Brian. With that, I think we have to end because it's like quarter after now, but thank you so much for the extra, extra time. Flew by, this flew by. Um, so where, where can people get a hold of you and, and if they want to write you, like send you a question or, or like, do you have I any mean, handles? My, my, my website is where, I mean, Facebook, right? The book is, everybody's on the book. I feel like, well, not so much. I think people like are like beginning to escape because they're realizing that Facebook is evil. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, but I'm on the book and uh, I'm also, uh, my website, if there's like, if like, if you're just like, what's going, I mean, my website right now clearly has nothing because it's the pandemic and nothing is going on. Um, but uh, it's typically where I put all upcoming um, projects and, activity, um, which is just briankihada.com. Brian Quijada of the jaw. But Brian of the jaw, Brian jaw. Um, yeah, yeah. Cool, man. Brian, thank, thank you so, so much, much for having me, everybody, and, and for sharing and, and, and kind of going on along in this, uh, uh, this awesome ride. I appreciate it.
Can, can we unmute everybody and just say goodbye? <laughs> yeah, everybody should be able to unmute yourselves. Oh, unmute yourselves, folks. Bye. Bye. Yeah, yeah, there we oh, go. All right. Oh, thanks thanks so much, y'all. Thanks, thanks for being here. You got a, you got a place to hang your head if you drop up. If you're going to Iowa and you need to stop in Pittsburgh, you can hang out with us. <laughs> That's right. Oh, pirates. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. We'll thanks go back to the Tiki Bar. That's right, man. We got to go back there. <laughs> okay. Bye. Up in the night, peace. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Thea. Bye.